Okay, in this screencast, I'm going to talk to you about thermal pollution. Now, when we think of pollution, we usually think of some sort of contaminant, some sort of a, a chemical that gets released in the environment that has some toxicity and some effect on organisms in the environment. But in this case, the substance that's being released is water, and water is obviously a healthy part of the environment. But the problem is this water has a heat energy contained in it, and that energy itself is causing the problem. So thermal pollution is an increase in water temperature as a result of human activities. Now, the human activities that do this, we'll just focus on three of the main ones. The main and biggest one is the discharge of cooling water from power plants where we generate electricity. Another one is by the removal of trees that shade stream banks, either through urbanization or clear cutting. And then another one is just hot water coming off of pavement in, uh, in urban areas. So let's start with the big one, the power plants. Okay, so first of all, we're gonna study this in our next unit anyway. You know, we're gonna have a lot to say about electrical production, but for right now, let's just focus on this. This is the basic way in which electricity is generated all over the world, all right? You have some sort of a structure in which you're going to, to release heat energy from a fuel source. Now, in this particular diagram, the fuel source has to be, happens to be uranium-235. Uh, uh, but, but this could very well be, we could replace this with coal, we could replace this with natural gas. The point is we're, we're taking some sort of nuclear potential energy or chemical potential energy and converting it into heat, okay? Now, the thing is I wanna turn that heat into electricity and to do that, we need to boil water. So what happens is I take this hot, hot uh, the heat from this reaction and I use it to, to boil water in a closed container where I can get very high steam pressures. So basically there's water here. I pump a, a, a transfer liquid through here. It could be water, it could be liquid sodium, it could be lots of things. But basically, I'm transferring heat energy from, from the that got released by the coal or the uranium. I'm using it to boil water. And then that water, once it's boiled into steam, that steam is under pressure. It's going to come through and it's going to pass by a turbine, which is essentially like a propeller. And it's going to spin this turbine, and that turbine is going to spin the magnets inside this generator, and that's going to generate the electricity that goes into our homes and offices. But now after the steam comes through here, what do we do with it? Well, we can't just put it back through here because uh, we can't transfer this heat energy as efficiently to steam as we can to liquid water. So we've got to take this steam and turn it back into liquid water, which means we've got to cool it down through a process called a, a device called a condenser. So you'll notice that, that power plants are always built next to a river. And that's because we need an inflow of cool water. So the cool water comes in from the river or reservoir, but usually it's a river, it's usually a flowing body of water. It comes in here, and as it flows through here, this steam is cooled down, turned back into a liquid and pumped back in here. So, so basically we have this closed system here in which liquid water is turned into steam, steam is condensed back into liquid water and pumped back in. But here's the thing, the steam, in order to turn back into liquid water, had to get rid of a lot of heat. And that heat energy is carried away by this, this flowing water. So now the water comes in at maybe 10 degrees Celsius, but it comes out of here at maybe 40 or 50 degrees Celsius, maybe 80 degrees Celsius. So it comes up. In, so we had to put it in these cooling towers that you associate with nuclear power plants, but all power plants have it. Coal plants have it. Natural gas doesn't matter. And then I cool the water down in here. And once it's cooled down sufficiently, then we release it back into the stream. The problem is what constitutes sufficiently. Now, first of all, I just want to say, uh, when you see power plants, you will notice stuff coming out of them. I see it every, almost every morning when I come into school in the morning. There's a, a, a it's actually a factory, but it has a, its own electrical generation facility on, 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 on hand. And you see these rising columns, and it looks like pollution, but that's just water vapor. They, they, they pumped water from their condensers into here, and then it's hot, so it evaporates, and it, it, it convex upwards. So when you see these columns of cloud-like stuff, it really is just water vapor. And you know what? Going into the air is really not a problem. It will quickly cool down and not be a problem. This type of, of outflow is not what we're talking about when we talk about thermal pollution. The problem is the water that remains in here is still fairly warm and, and 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 you can't just leave it there because otherwise you need so many of these. So you can only get it to cool down so so much. And by the way, the shape is designed to maximize the surface area to volume, kind of like in a blood cell, to try to get rid of that heat into the environment as much as possible. But still, we still release water in, in, into the stream since it's a little bit warmer than it should be, or in case a lot warmer. So basically what happens is here's the water flowing in from upstream, okay? Comes in at one temperature. 
here's my cooling tower where I'm trying to wait. Uh, yeah, I got the water that I brought out of the condenser of the power plant. It's cooling in here. Now I'm, I'm releasing it. But when I release it into the stream, as the water comes by and I dump this water in the stream, the, the water that comes downstream from the cooling tower is significantly warmer. I'm talking like up to 10 degrees Celsius warmer. And that's significant. And so this is what we mean by thermal pollution, is that we took water that was at one temperature and we turned it into water at a different temperature. I mean, it's the same water. We basically took this water here, put it in the power plant, put it back here hot, and then released it. So it's still, it's the same, chemically it's the same water. The only chemical difference is in dissolved oxygen. Because dissolved oxygen, if you recall, like all gases, it uh, gases lose their solubility in liquids with temperature. So we find is as the temperature of water increases, the ability of oxygen to dissolve into it decreases. So, so if that water came in at say, uh, uh, five Celsius, it might have maybe, you know, up 12 and a half, 12.5 uh, milligrams per liter of DO. But if I increase it 10 degrees, when it comes out, and now I'm down here around nine, nine and a half. So I, I significantly reduced the available oxygen in the water by heating it up. Well, things that breathe water need it. So, you know, fish and insect larvae, among other things, they breathe water. So they, 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 they survive by taking, they respire by taking water that's dissolved in water. So DO, you know, just like you take water, the oxygen that's dissolved in the air to breathe, fish and insects take, uh, take oxygen that's dissolved in water to breathe. Well, what happens is the, the, when the temperature is cool, the dissolved oxygen levels are high enough that the fish are perfectly healthy, no problem. Now, here's the water coming out of my cooling tower, dumping in. Now the water temperature is much warmer. What happens is immediately the dissolved oxygen levels drop, and when they drop, so do the fish. The fish drop dead. So basically, I killed fish by suffocating them by taking water that was cool and turning into water that was hot. So I took water that was oxygenated, heated it up, so now it can no longer hold enough oxygen to support aquatic life. Now, it gets even worse than this, though, and here's why. It, the water, once I dump it out of here, it's going to very quickly come back up to, to what we call ambient temperatures. You know, it's, it's going to come up to the, to, to the same. It's, it before, it's not going to follow too far downstream before the temperature downstream is the same as the temperature was upstream. But the problem's not done yet. You would think, well, once it cools back down, you know, oxygen can get into it through, you know, rippling waves, whatever. But no, and here's why. When these fish die, their bodies decompose. And when their bodies decompose, nutrients released in the water. And you remember eutrophication, you put nutrients in the water and then the algae blooms. And when the algae blooms, the algae dies. And the bottom line is you end up with these al algal blooms and just basically eutrophication, right? So in eutrophication, you get the algal blooms followed by uh, the death of the algae, followed by the consumption by bacteria. And again, you have low DO and the fish die. So the bottom, the problem is even far downstream from these, these power plants, you have streams that just don't support much life. And, and that's at least much, much animal life. And that's because uh, we've, we've disrupted the oxygen levels and, and, and produced fish kills. Now, another one, and this probably won't be on the test, but it might be, you never know. I mean, this is a rather interesting one. So one thing that can also happen from thermal pollution, it's been noted, is it can disrupt migratory behavior. So uh, there's a, a particularly beloved and endangered species. Look at how adorable it is. The manatee, the dugong, it goes by lots of names, but these occur all over the world. They're mostly endangered because they're fairly docile. They're big, they're, they're hit by motorboats, they're hunted. You know, they're, they're kind of like hippos. They're, they're these beautiful, gentle creatures, right? They, and they have them in uh, Central America, on the East Coast, they have them in Florida. But in Florida, it tends to be on the border of their range. So what we find is manatees typically would migrate up into Florida in the summer months when the water is warm, and then migrate back into Central America and, and, and Mexico when the water gets colder in the winter. But what's happened is with, it, with the, the development of cities like uh, Miami and Fort Lauderdale and these other cities, what's happened is that the outflow into the ocean in this case is so warm that these creatures just congregate here because they get confused. They're, they're supposed to seek warm water, there's warm water here. Well, the pro what's the problem? Well, there's not a good food supply here. So they, they, they tend to get weakened and diseased. And so it's caused a disruption, not in just in migratory patterns, but a decrease in their uh, overall health of the population. Now, another way we, we, we lose DO from streams that we get thermal pollution is by removing trees that shade them. So, so, so in a normal, in most normal, uh, 
riparian environments, at least when the streams are small, there'll be a lot of, of, of trees overlapping it, making like a canopy, and that, that shades the water and keeps it from getting too warm. And what happens is with urban development and clear cutting, we, we tend to expose that water to sunlight. And if the streams aren't very big, then, then that can be, they can warm them up enough to make a difference. If they're large streams, it's not that big of an issue. When they're small streams, it does make an issue. And unfortunately, we look around here, you know, as much as I, I love the way the urban development has happened here in the greater Seoul area, we have these great uh, river walks, you know, but but those river walks, basically, you know, they're designed to make the river visible to people, which is nice. But the problem is, it's not very great for the uh, aquatic environment, because they're just exposed to, to light. So I mean, there's, there's a lot of problems with these urban streams that we'll discuss later. Now, another thing I want to talk to you about is called the heat island effect. Now, uh, this is something that we find uh, in cities. So anytime you build a city, if you look at a temperature profile of the rural areas compared to the city, you see this marked increase in temperature over a city. Okay, the areas around a city, their air just tends to be a lot warmer. I'm talking about the five degrees warmer uh, than it would be in the surrounding areas. So let's see why that would be, okay? So basically in a rural area, that when the energy hits the ground, it's going to be used for photosynthesis. It's going to, that, that, that energy from the sun, instead of being turned into heat, is being, is being used to be stored as uh, chemical potential energy in the photosynthate compounds that are made, like sugars and the starches. But in cities, I don't have those plants to do that. I mean, and by the way, you've noticed this. If you've ever walked on a, on a hot sidewalk or a driveway or something like that in bare feet, oh man, it hurts. But the second you step onto the grass, you get this sweet relief, like, oh man, it feels so much better. Why? Because it's, it is the difference. Pavement, when, when light hits the pavement, it just gets converted into thermal energy. But when it hits plants, it gets converted into sugars uh, and into, and, and it gets, uh, there's, there's uh, transpiration, which is carrying energy away. So what we find is rural areas having a lot more in, in, in the way of green plants have a lot less uh, in the way of, of thermal energy being produced from sunlight. But in cities, that light just gets turned into, into heat energy, okay? Uh, basically, it hits roads, it hits buildings, it hits roofs, and just gets hot. Now, and, and to make it even worse, in cities, uh, we have a lot of cars. Cars, as you notice, they generate heat, right? You know, if you ever you know, put your hand on the hood of a car, you notice it's, it's get, it gets hot. People live in buildings that, that when it's hot, what do they do? They turn on the air conditioner. Well, if you ever put your hand on, on, on one side, inside your house, you put your hand on the air conditioner, it's nice and cold, right? But you can't create or destroy energy, right? So if the energy is going down in my house, it must mean it's going somewhere. It's going outside your house. Basically, all an air conditioner does is it pumps heat energy from inside your house to the outside of your house, all right? And so that means the outside is, is quite warm. If you ever put your hand on the back side of an air conditioner, it's quite hot. And so uh, so between having cars and air conditioners, that, that, that further increases the heat island effect. Well, well, well so, so how is this related to thermal pollution other than the fact that it makes people uncomfortable? Well, here's how. Okay, keep in mind, rural areas tend to have uh, uh, a lack of pavement, so they have a lot of permeable surface, so you do get a lot of infiltration. So, so rainwater it tends to sink into the soils in, um, in rural areas, but in cities we have a lot of impervious surface. We have, we have sidewalks and driveways and roofs. Now, all of these things have been getting hot in the sunlight, right? And now when it does rain, uh, they, 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 that rainwater is going to get heated up. And, and because there's not much opportunity for infiltration, you know, urban runoff is a big thing. So that, that just gets dumped into the rivers. And so what happens is the river water tends to be greatly increased in temperature, almost like a, a power plant would do. But in this case, it's being heated by uh, the hot pavement and, and roofs of a city. Okay, that's thermal pollution. Thanks for listening. I hope this one was shorter than the other ones. Let me see if I figure out how to turn this off. Uh, no, I do this.